before I get started, because some of you guys are saying, who's this guy? Some of you might know, most of you probably don't. Just like the name up there says, it's Coach Mike Jarvis. It's, the last name is spelled J-A-R-V-I-S. The reason why I spell it is because when I first say it, most people don't really understand what I'm saying. And the reason is, is because I was born in the People's Republic of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you know how folks from the North sound. They sound a little bit funny. All right, so I just want to get that out. A couple other things I want to share with you because I consider this to be family. All right, I'm here because I was introduced by Coach Skeeter, okay, to Pastor Singletary. We formed a relationship. He did read my book. He thought the title of the book would be incredibly appropriate for this occasion for the men of valor. Born in Cambridge, when I grew up, my nickname was Crisco, C-R-I-S-C-O. I got that nickname from a friend of mine because he didn't want to make me feel bad and call me Fatso, so he called me Crisco. And he said, you know, you remind me of the fat in the can, so your name is Crisco. So I'm Crisco. I also want to tell you that I got two birthdays that I celebrate in the month of April. April 11th is my chronological birthday. And I'm giving you this information because, like I said, we're family. I like to get birthday presents, all right? So in April, you got two opportunities. The 11th, that's the day I was born, chronologically. But the most important day of my life is my spiritual birthday, which is April the 29th. All right, so the reason why I love to give those two dates is because the first date, my chronological birthday, occurred in 1945. My spiritual birthday was in 2005. So I got a choice. I can either be 71 or 11. I'm 11. All right, you know 11-year-olds love presents. The first present I ever got that really I remembered for the, it happened to be on my 11th birthday. My de dearly departed brother Richard presented me with my first basketball. I took that basketball and I was heading to the basketball courts and before I could get to the courts, I heard this guy yelling, Crisco! It was the Little League baseball coach in the neighborhood and he was inviting me over to play baseball. And I was so happy, I didn't know what to do. It would be the first team I ever played on. I looked around. Baseball, you need nine players. There were only eight. I looked a little further, and there was this place they called home plate. And on top of home plate was all this equipment, catcher's gear. And they always put the little fat kid behind the plate. So I was the catcher on my first team. But you know, I didn't realize then something I know now, and that is there's a Jewish saying, a Yiddish saying, man plans, God laughs. Man plans, God laughs. And God must have an incredible sense of humor. First of all, he's got about 400 people in this room that he could laugh at any time he wanted and, and have a lot of amusement by because we have made God laugh often. Now, here's what I also know about that saying. Is any plan that we have, God's plan is that much better. His plans always trump ours. Now, some of you, I've got a couple of questions I need to ask you and I want you to leave here with. Number one, why did you come? Some of you would be very honest and say, I came because I wanted to come and because I wanted to be a part of the Men of Valor. And I wanted to learn more about God, about his son, Jesus Christ. I wanted to basically become more and more in tune with my coach. Some of you would say, if you were honest, I came because my best friend came. Or some of you might even say, I came because my mom or my dad kicked me out the house. Or my coach said, I have to go. 
But you know what? It doesn't make any difference why you came. You're here. And now the most important thing is, what do you leave here with? Do you leave here better than when you came? Second question, and I want to show of hands. How many of you uh, have been, or how many of you have been born again, have been saved, have basically made the commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Would you raise your hands, please? Okay, that's a lot more hands than I thought would be up. You can put them down. Now, some of you also put your hands up because the person next to you put their hand up. And you haven't made that commitment yet. And you know who you are. But I'm going to go on the assumption that the hands that were up are all legit. Because if that's the case, this group and this audience is far more together than most are. Because normally it would be about 20% of the people okay, in a particular audience. Even in a quote-unquote Christian school that have been saved, that have been born again. A lot of people have no idea what that means, being born again, being saved, making that commitment, because a lot of people don't understand what the word commitment really means. Now, if I ask a coach, and I'm putting you on the stand, okay, because you got my hairdo and you got the beard I used to have, all right, coach, you, what does commitment mean to you? Just give me your definition. Uh, you know, Commitment means what? Sacrifice. It means sacrifice. How about you, coach? Or dad? Promise. Promise. Anybody else want to just give me, give me one? Okay, it's, it could be, you know what, if I asked all 400 people here to give me a word or to give me a definition, every one of you would be right. I guarantee you, part of what you're saying would actually be part of what commitment is. Now, the way I define commitment is very simple. Commitment means... I am all in. I'm all in. Am I committed to my relationship with my wife? Yes. Next September, we celebrate number 49. Okay, so I mean, yeah, yeah, give it up. Not for me, because any woman that's married for a coach with a, to a coach for more than one year should get a rounding applause. 49 years. I got two kids, got a son, got a daughter. My son and I were the first African-American father-son team in the history of Division I basketball. In 1993, he joined me at George Washington University. At the age of 12, he was my assistant to the McDonald's All-American game. Well, we had a couple of pretty good players on our team, and one of the guys happened to be named Michael Jordan. My high school player, was Patrick Ewing. I taught Patrick Ewing how to play basketball at the age of 12. Now this is a perfect example of God laughing at our plans. When Patrick was 12 years of age, he was brought into my gym by his phys ed teacher who said, and asked me, he said, would you teach this young man who just came from Jamaica how to play basketball? And before I even answered the question, I said, what's his name? And I said, no, young man, tell me your name, please. So he mumbled in a very soft voice his name. And I said, no, no, you got to do better than that. So he finally said, my name is Patrick Ewing. And I said to Steve, his, his teacher, I said, why do you want Patrick to play basketball? Patrick was about 6'3 already, 6'4, tall, skinny. And I figured he'd tell me because he's tall and because, you know, all tall people play basketball. Well, we know that's not true. Most seven-footers don't play because they're awful. So they don't even bother. All right. So he said, I want Patrick to play basketball because I want him to make friends. He doesn't have any friends. All the kids in Cambridge are making fun of him because he's so tall. And when he, play, when he does play, he falls down. He's awkward. He's got bad hands. And I said, you know what? You want him to play basketball to make friends. Well, that was Steve's plan. God's plan was to put Patrick with me so that not only would it help my career, but more importantly, it would give him 
a coach who could teach him the right way to play basketball so that someday he could go on to become one of the top 50 players of all time. He would go from being the kid that everybody laughed at and made fun at to a kid that they were trying to borrow money from their friends so they could buy a ticket to go see him play. A kid who went from sleeping in a, on a bed that was never long enough with a white sheet serving as his door to his bedroom to a kid that would make $18 million in his last season of basketball. That's how God works. Some of you guys came in here today, like I said, for whatever reason. Some of you guys have got plans that you have made for what you hope your life will be, and some of those plans involve playing in the NFL or playing in some NFL. And I don't know if one of you, I don't know if one of you will ever make it to the NFL, but I know this, none of you will ever make it if you don't try to do everything you can, which includes being the best student that you can, not only at the game that you play, but at the school that you go to, so that if you make it, you will be able to survive and stay in that game for a long time, like Patrick ended up playing in the NBA for 18 years. So it's one thing to make it, it's another t thing to basically be able to maintain it. So I am hoping and I'm praying that you guys dare to dream, because I've heard that for today, but I also know this, that 99.9% of the people that want to play professional sports do not, do not. Okay, you heard this morning that college players, they're greater than high school players. Professional players, that's a whole nother league. But here's what I know. You can try to do anything that you want to do. And if you have the most important person attached to that dream and that promise, and you work with him and give him what he wants, then he might give you what you want. But he doesn't always give you what you want. He gives you what you need. And he will make sure that you have a life that's definitely worth living, living, and it may not be doing exactly what you want to do. Now, many of you out there are probably saying to yourself, you know, I don't know if I could ever be anything because I haven't been equipped with, you know, maybe a dad that's been, you know, like feeding me and nurturing me and to helping develop me. Well, you know what? Many of us did not have dads who were present in the home. Many of us did not have dads who were present in the community. My dad was an incredibly talented carpenter. The only problem with my dad is he did not like to work. So instead of him going to work and providing for his family, his wife, my mother, had to work three and four jobs to do what he should have done. Now, many of my friends use the excuse that they didn't have a dad for their failures. I knew, see, early on that I had a dad. Now, I didn't know exactly who he was quite really. I mean, I, I knew I had a dad. And here's what I'm saying to every single one of you sitting here. You have a dad. Whether he's in your house, whether you've ever seen him or not, you have a dad. Jesus Christ is your father. God is your dad. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, that's your dad. So every one of you has got a dad. And you know what? Don't ever use the excuse that you don't, you're not going to make it or you can't make it because you don't have a dad. You have the greatest, you have the most, you have a perfect father. He has never, ever promised anything. And if you read his playbook, the Bible, every prophecy, everything that he's ever said has come true or will come true. He's like a football player that you give the ball to 50 times and he runs for 50 touchdowns. He's like a basketball player that takes 100 shots and makes 100 shots. But he does it all 
the time. Now, I don't have a lot of time, but I do know this, that one of the questions that I ask, because the next question I'm going to ask you is, if you died tonight, if you died tonight, peacefully in your sleep, where are you going to wake up tomorrow morning? If you die tonight, where are you going to wake up tomorrow morning? Are you going to wake up in heaven or are you going to wake up in hell? Simple question. There's two, there's two options, heaven or hell. There is no purgatory, heaven or hell. That's what the Bible says. Well, when I left New York, before I left New York, when I was coaching at St. John's University and I was coaching a young man by the name of Ron Artest who later became World Meta Peace, and we came within three points of getting to the Final Four. We lost to Ohio State in the Elite Eight, 77 to 74. in 1999 and prior to that or during that season people were telling me that I was the king of New York and I believed that crap I believed the hype just like some of you believe the hype that people have been feeding you that I was the greatest thing and the greatest coach and that it was just a matter of time before I'd be in the Naismith Hall of Fame. I believed it. But you want to know something? God has a way of sometime shaking us up, waking us up, because it wasn't long thereafter. In fact, it was like six months after we won the National Invitation Tournament in Madison Square Garden before 18,000 people, and we cut down the nets on ESPN, that I heard the words that, have been made famous by a guy who's running for president, you're fired. You're fired. And you know, if it wasn't for the fact that my wife and I moved to Florida and we found a church home, and the first day I went into Spanish River Church, I sat down with my wife, and the pastor started preaching, but more importantly started teaching, and it was for the first time in my life I ever started to hear the gospel, the bad news about how every one of us is born into sin and that we were, out of, we were out of a relationship. We would have no relationship with God, our Father, if Jesus Christ didn't go on a recruiting trip and come after each and every one of us and if he didn't give up his life and hang on the cross and do you know, some of you probably don't know, like I didn't know, that Jesus Christ hung on the cross, stark, naked, not one stitch, there was no white robe around him. So here he is being humiliated to the nth degree, nothing on, shed all of his blood for you and I. And the reason why he was born to a virgin was because he had to be totally pure in order to pay for our sins, because up until that time, animals were sacrificed to pay for sins. I knew nothing about that. See, I believed that I would, when I was asked the question, where would I go if I died tonight? I said, I'm going to go to heaven. And, I, and so the Pastor Nicholas said, why are you going to heaven? Why do you think you're going to heaven? And I said, well, you know why, Pastor? I'm a good person. I'm a good husband. I'm a good son. I'm a good father. I give to the poor. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't robbed any 7-Elevens lately. I'm going to heaven. He says, oh, no, my brother, it don't work like that. He says, the only way you're going to heaven is if you are born again, if you are saved, if you give your life and dedicate your life and walk along and join God's team, and you play with Jesus Christ. You've you got to become a member of his team. Then all of a sudden, it finally dawned on me. And then over a period of time, I heard the gospel. 
the good news. And everybody in this room should be able to recite John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him shall not die, shall not perish, but have eternal life. And let me tell you something. When my brother Richard, who gave me my first basketball, died, and I got up to speak at his funeral, I was so happy to hear all the great people talk about what a great guy he was, but I left there wondering if, my, if I would ever see my brother again in heaven, because I do not know to this day whether or not my brother Richard was born again, was saved. He was the greatest guy in the world. But that does not get you in heaven. Last week, I told the coaches and pastors last night, I was so happy to watch the Muhammad Ali funeral and listen to all, most of the people say incredibly great things about what a great person he was, how much good he had done. But I don't know if Muhammad Ali, if I'm going to meet him in heaven, because it's not about the works that we do. It's about our relationship and whether or not we have been born again or saved. That's what it's all about, everybody. So don't let anybody tell you, oh yeah, I'll see so and so in heaven. You pray that they're there. Make sure you get there. And if they're there, that's an extra bonus. And here's the last thing I want to say right now about the fact that everybody needs a head coach. All of us have had coaches. At times I referred to my wife as my head coach. At times I referred to my college coach as my head coach. At times I referred to my brother as my head coach. But my real head coach, the head coach, and if, when I write the next book, it's going to be everybody needs the master head coach. Subtitle, his name is Jesus Christ. So in the last couple of words that I want to say is if you are born again, if you are saved, if you know that Jesus Christ is your head coach, you can't keep that a secret. You've got to let your friends, you've got to start with your family. Don't be afraid to go home and ask whoever it is, hey, listen, I just got to ask you a question. If you died tonight, where do you think, where, no, not where do you think, where will you wake up in the morning? And if they say, heaven, then say, why is that so? And then after you listen to their answer, if they haven't given the answer that God gives us in the Bible, which clearly states that you have to go through the Son to get to the Father, please, share the gospel with them. In closing, each one of you is going to receive, because see, everybody needs a head coach, not only to teach them what I just talked about, because that's the most important life skill that you could ever, ever learn, is how to be born again, how to be saved, how to be a Christian. You're going to each get a copy of my first book I wrote, which is entitled Skills for Life. Because everybody needs a coach, a head coach, that's going to teach them these life skills. So your earthly coaches, and your, which are your parents, your coaches in school, should be teaching you life skills that you can use to be successful in whatever you do. Coaches, pastors, all the older folks, I hope you'll get a copy of this book as well to go along with and compliment, okay, my life skills book. At the very end of the book, and I'm over time, and I told Pastor Singletary I'd probably go a few minutes over, so he already knows, and if you make a guy wait from 8 in the morning to speak, it's too bad. All right. 
but where is he? I hear him laughing somewhere. He's back there. I hear you. And I see you looking at the clock, and you've asked the guy twice already. Didn't that clock hit zero? All right, here's, how, here's what I'd like to leave you with. On April the 29th, 2005, I was sitting out in the back of my house, and I was reading the life booklet that my pastor had given to me. And I read what most people would refer to as the sinner's prayer. And I just want to close by reading this, and I've changed the wording just a little bit, which I don't think God would mind. It says, Lord Jesus, I want you to become my head coach. I come to you acknowledging that I am a sinner, because we were all born into sin, thanks to Adam and Eve, and cannot make myself acceptable to you through my own efforts. Nothing I can do can pay for what you have done for me. I believe you went to the cross as my substitute to be judged in my place. And by doing so, you saved me from the judgment I deserve. You did for me what I could not do for myself. I trust you to give me a new life, starting right now, that works. And I know you are the only one who can give it to me. Furthermore, I believe with all of my heart and soul that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one, no one, can come to the Father except through you. Lord Jesus, please give me the necessary strength and wisdom to live like you so that I may successfully complete the work that you have sent me here to do. I read that three times, and then I signed on the dotted line on April 29, 2005. And you know what? The one Hall of Fame that I wanted to get into, because I'm in a few, but I, my, as a youngster growing up, when I started coaching, I dreamt of being in the Naismith Hall of Fame with all of the great coaches. And people kept telling me I'd be there. But you want to know something? I wouldn't trade the Naismith Hall of Fame or any amount of money that I have made and spent over the years for the eternal Hall of Fame. And my prayer and my hope and my desire today is that I will meet each and every one of you and each and every one of your kids someday in heaven. God bless you. I hope and pray that you'll have an incredible life and that some of you, or, or most of you, will try to, maybe, to make it to some great heights. Some of you will get there, but all of you will be successful if you get and become a member of God's team. God bless you, and uh, thank you.